Um, my name is Laura, and I'm a member of the organizing committee for the New York City DSA Healthcare Working Group. Um, and I'll be moderating this evening along with um, Amr, who's also here with us. Um, Amr is going to be moderating the chat. So as we go, if you have thoughts, if you have questions, if anything sparks to you, um, please feel free to drop your questions, comments in the chat. I'm going to ask just in the name of not devolving into chaos <laughs> that um, we, we all type things in the chat as opposed to jumping in and unmuting and trying to navigate that. And then um, at the end, we'll have a Q&A section where um, Amr will, will have taken down your questions and we'll ask them to our panel. Um, but before we introduce our panel, we have a very special guest with us. Um, Naomi, if you wouldn't mind introducing yourself and then um, she's gonna give us a great presentation on some of the research that she's done about Medicaid expansion and eviction rates. Sure, thanks. So I'm Naomi Zodi. Um, I'm an assistant professor at the CUNY School of Public Health and I teach health economics there. And um, yeah, so let me just get started because I actually have to teach tonight. Um, basically, you know, I mean, yeah, this is research about Medicaid expansion but it's, I mean, Medicaid expansion is just like a small little window into what we could have with the New York Health Act. You know, I mean, when we think about what the New York Health Act is, it's um, no deductibles, no co-pays, no networks, all care is free for all people. You know, just necessary health care steps away from your home. You don't have to think about the cost. So that would be like just, really amazing thing for us to win. I mean, it's really like a national scandal. Our, our American healthcare system is pretty abysmal. So we expanded Medicaid, but basically what I found is that like it had a lot of um, spillover benefits outside of that. So one of them is just a reduction in the rate of poverty. Um, you know, significantly fewer households ha are unable to meet their basic needs because healthcare is taken care of, you know, that sounds like maybe obvious, but it's not necessarily true. I mean, Medicaid expansion is a healthcare program, just like the New York Health Act, you know, I mean, these are healthcare programs, but the fact is we really can't disentangle the effects of getting healthcare coverage from um, all of the other needs that households have. So it kind of just like frees up money for other things. Um, the way that we conducted this research is that, so the, the way Medicaid expansion happened is that, you know, not every state did it immediately. Some did it earlier. Many of them did it in 2014 when the ACA expansion started. And then like every year after that, states have been voting to expand Medicaid. So we can look at the pre-post effect, um, in a way that's like not tainted by just like what was happening in the economy or in the country at that time. You can kind of net out the, the time trend. So we can just taste test based on the pre-post of each state, regardless of when that pre-post happened. So we get kind of like, we end up with pretty clean estimates of what is the actual effect of Medicaid expansion. So what we found is that um, on average, each year about 700,000 people avoid, you know, I mean, so, so what does it mean not to be in poverty? The official federal line of poverty is pretty difficult to live on. It's around 12,000 for a single adult in a year in, in total income. So that's um, like abysmally low. Um, but the fact is that people fall below it and that Medicaid expansion prevents that from happening. So it's not just that it reduced kind of this measure of poverty, but also rates of home evictions. And we looked at that like in two different ways. One of them, so the reason that it makes sense that Medicaid expansion or healthcare in general is going to have a big effect for housing is that, so this is just looking at households below the poverty line, but just like poor families spend so much money on housing. And actually that's kind of true for everybody. It's, it's a major like expenditure out of households budgets every single month, you know, I mean, usually up. 
a third in New York, it's a lot of times closer to half. So just looking nationwide, most poor families spend, you know, half of their every monthly budget um, just towards rent. And in, in New York State, that's particularly high. I think it's like 47% of New York State residents are considered um, rent burdened, meaning that more than 30% of their budget is going to housing. So it makes sense that if you have, say, you know, a chronic condition that you have to get prescription for every month, every once in a while, um, you're gonna have to choose between your rent and that medication. It makes sense because housing is such an important feature in households uh, spending. Um, or if an extraordinary healthcare you know, event happens, housing, because it eats up so much of that budget is gonna be like, is gonna be the hardest thing to meet. Um, like they say that the rent eats first um, and, and then a lot of times, you know, that directly conflicts with um, people's ability to get healthcare. So I think this picture says a lot. Um, 2014 was when the, most of the Medicaid expansions happened. In 2012 was when some of the states started. So California started in 2012, for example. And um, evictions in these ex expansion states fell while eviction rates in non-expansion states stayed steady. Um, and after we threw a bunch of different types of statistical tests at it, the effect remained. So it wasn't just something that was happening. So we also looked at this in a much more narrow case uh, in just the state of California. So in California, when they expanded Medicaid, some counties expanded before other counties. So even within that state, there would be counties next to one another. One would expand and the other wouldn't just based on like what that county administration decided to do. And it would he happen even within a year in you know six month intervals or even four month intervals. So you can get extremely like fine grained estimates and basically just um, really be able to attribute the relationship. And again, so we find that regardless of which month it was that a particular county uh, expanded Medicaid in California, the pre and post on average, it's kind of steady before the expansion and then it just continuously falls. So significant reduction in evictions associated with Medicaid expansion nationally and even just within the state of California. This has so many different implications for households because poverty and housing instability is a, a major source of trauma for children, for adults, you know, for families. It's associated with all different kinds of harms. For example, um, drug overdoses and, and, and use of drugs in public. Like just not having a place to just live your life has major implications and, and the feedbacks for your health status. So why haven't we done anything about it? We have a pretty pervasive ideology of markets in our medical care system, but there's so many reasons why medical care is not, you know, I mean, it is actually an important right to be able to have something that you make and to be able to sell it. Uh, but we're so far removed from that when we're thinking about the production and consumption of medical care. We have these huge hospital systems that have so much kind of market power, they drive their own prices and consumers really have no pathway for pushing down prices. It just doesn't even make sense. You can't price yeah. shop in, in, in emergency care, for example, or in most medical care. It's yeah. just not, the setting just doesn't match. So, um, so because those markets don't work, what we end up with is a lot of public government intervention on behalf of the producers of medical care, insurance companies, physician licensures, you know, enabling these monopolies and insurance companies. But when we try to intervene on behalf of consumers, that's when, that, <clears throat> that's when we get all these political problems. Um, why? You know, here's one example, the Sackler family, and it, it's not really about the personalities of the people themselves, um, but they just have so much power, they just can't help themselves. If we wanna think about exactly how unequal is wealth distribution in the United States, let's do this. We'll take 100 people to represent all Americans and $100 to represent its wealth. So one thing we could do would give 
we give every person one dollar, but that is not how we distribute wealth in this country. First thing we do is we give forty dollars to the first guy, and I say guy because you know ninety percent of the world's billionaires are men. In fact, we give the next forty dollars to the next nine people, and then that leaves us with twenty dollars to spread across the other ninety people. And in reality, it's worse because the last few owe the first few. It's not just that it's bad, it's that it's getting worse over time. So in the 80s and 90s, as computers are being introduced into production, into the American economy, employees and the rest of us, all of the people, we didn't all benefit from the productivity that was generated. It all went to whoever owned the company. So the top 1% over that time period is really like running away with all of the increased productivity. So what can we do about it? Um, this is a study that I'm working on now. And essentially, in the status quo, as your income increases, the percentage of your income that you're putting towards your health care is falling. Because um, everybody has to pay roughly the same insurance premiums, but some people's incomes are a lot, a lot higher. So what we have is like this really regressive, and everybody has to pay for health care because we all have human bodies that need medical care. So it ends up becoming essentially like a tax because we all have to pay into it, except that it's a tax to a private company and it's a regressive tax. So that's what our current system looks like. If we want to do something like the public option, say letting everybody buy into Medicaid, for example, we're squeezing providers. We can get a little bit of money out of the system, but essentially it doesn't change um, that regressive distribution. The, the great benefit of tax financing healthcare, number one is that we get rid of all this administrative excess and burden that sets the United States apart from all these other countries. And so we just save money. So it's a lot cheaper than the ridiculous system we have today. And also, you know, financially, the way that we distribute that cheaper amount of cost um, is that we can choose to do it rationally. We can choose to do it equitably. We can choose for households that have a greater ability to contribute, to contribute more. And, um, and to alleviate the burden at the bottom so that they can go on and spend all their money on the basic needs that they have like housing um, and, and food. Okay, so that's, that's my presentation. Thank you so much, Naomi. I've got That's like incredible. 15 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, before we, we lose Naomi, does anyone have a, a, any very quick questions maybe in the chat? All right, well, Naomi, I know you have to run, so well, we, won't, <laughs> we won't keep you. I see our, Dante is in Dallas. I'm from Houston, actually. Oh, no, so hey, I'm cool. from Dallas, Hopefully too. we'll get the... <laughs> Houston's yeah. Got a strong but, Texas um, contingent. Yes, we'll get the Texas Health Act soon. No. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, you know, I, I guess like I didn't really uh, like focus on housing that much. I mean, I think that the, the connection though really here is just the fact that housing is so, so important in like the effect it has in people's lives and also in like how expensive it is for people to be able to meet. So when we take care of, healthcare, um, we take care of housing too. And, and hopefully it can also kind of open up our collective political imagination for decommodifying more of our basic human needs. Absolutely. All right. Well. All right, well, I'm gonna run. You guys All right, yeah, thank you so it. much. Um, Sure. Bye. <laughs> Bye, Naomi. Thank you. All right. Um, and then without further ado, let's go ahead and dive in. I'll attempt to pin and, <laughs> and introduce our panel. Um, and first up, just in the order that I have everybody written down, um, we have Assembly Member um, Marcella Matenas. Uh, Marcella, if you just want to tell us a little bit about yourself, what you do, and it's such a, a broad question because you know housing and healthcare are so fundamental. But you know, if, if you want to talk about you know particularly what what drives you around these issues. Uh, yes. Uh, can you guys hear me? Okay. Um, yeah. So I am Marcella Martinez. I am the first uh, Peruvian immigrant in the state legislature. 
Um, I immigrated from Peru with my family and moved to Sunset Park when I was five. Um, about 10 years ago, I had my own uh, housing displacement uh, problem, and that really got me involved into uh, working with my neighbors, understanding the laws that currently existed that facilitated uh, landlords being able to evict their tenants that are paying low rents and bring in tenants that are paying a higher rent, um, was organizing and working uh, in coalition, doing advocacy work in my community, um, and then uh, decided to run for office and in part of the largest incoming class uh, for 2021. And we just finished um, we just finished dealing with the budget, um, which there's a lot of great uh, programs coming in, a lot of infusion of money from the federal government really giving us a lot of opportunities, um, but also somewhat disappointed because of uh, revenue raises that we had proposed where we were uh, trying to uh, tackle the income inequality um, and trying to implement things that would also uh, over uh, long term, really, uh, you know, start making it more, uh, make the taxes more equitable. Um, but just, you know, a lot of work uh, still to do. Absolutely, thank you. And um, next, we'll pass it over to our soon-to-be elected, Michael Hollingsworth. Hey, everybody. Um, so yeah, my name is Michael Hollingsworth. Um, uh, I was born, born, and raised here in in Brooklyn. Um, I got into um, housing work uh, like about five years ago when I live in a rent stabilized building. The landlord started to convert empty units into million million dollar condos, and that's what sparked my activism. I joined a local group called the Crown Heights Tenant Union, um, and I, you know, I, uh, so that was sort of my entry point into this work and you know since that time I've obviously I joined uh, DSA I'm also part of housing justice for all coalition which is the statewide housing coalition that won the new rent laws in 2019 I'm also part of rent justice coalition which is a group that does work here in the city specifically for rent stabilized tenants um, and yeah so um, tenant work has is what got me into it and it got me into activism and it's what's kept me um, doing it even after the issues with my particular building um, got resolved and yeah it just means a lot to me the city is where we're a city um, where two-thirds of us are tenants and I feel like our voices are often ignored um, and our concerns and our issues are dismissed and so you know I think it's time for us to um, you know to take our rightful place you know in the halls of government and um, and fight for our issues um, so yeah, and I'm uh, happy to be here this evening with all of you. Thank you so much for being here. Um, and lastly, uh, Karen from our own New York City DSA Housing Working Group. Thanks, Laura, and thanks everyone. Happy to be here. Um, Marcella and I were on a um, housing working group call last night, so we can all be on a panel together every night. Um, there's so much going on, um, and I think I'm excited um, you know, a lot of what Naomi said in her presentation about the kind of regressive and punitive way that healthcare works in this country is also true for housing, the reliance on markets. Um, and we've been um, doing a lot of work in the housing working group, um, organizing folks to go on rent strike in their buildings. We've been um, organizing the last year um, around rent relief and eviction moratoriums and excited to talk about um, what's next and what the links are between um, housing justice and healthcare. Thank you, Karen. Yeah, I think the thing that I'm interested in tonight is just really exploring what those intersections are between housing and healthcare, because they're both united by this, this sort of central problem, if we could name it briefly, it's just that both are, are fundamental human rights that currently we're treating as commodities. So um, we've assembled this amazing panel today, and our goal is just to explore those intersections further and, and start talking about how we can imagine that future where housing and healthcare are, are guaranteed universal human rights. Um, so the first thing that I wanted to, to sort of introduce as a topic for our panel um, is the economic burden that both healthcare and housing are placing on New Yorkers. Like Naomi mentioned, over half of New York City renters are considered rent burdened, which means that over 30% of their income is spent on rent. 
And half of those people, which is a quarter of all renters in New York City, are severely rent burdened, which means that they're paying over half of their income in rent. And then at the same time, there was another study done a few years back that showed that the average New Yorker was paying over $6,000 per person per year on healthcare costs. So we know that this is an enormous economic burden on everyone. And at the same time, we know that housing security is linked to positive health outcomes. And as Naomi was saying, free and affordable care is linked to greater housing security. Um, and one sort of instance where I, that I think maybe exemplifies that, that we could jump off with, uh, was the start of the COVID-19 pandemic, um, when one of the, the first calls that arose was for rent cancellation. And I know, again, Karen and Marcel, I know you guys were just talking about this. Um, so maybe if you guys wanted to, to talk to us a little bit about, about that fight to cancel rent, um, where it started, where we are now, and, and where, it's, where it's heading. Yeah, I can I can start. Um, I mean, I think that uh, there was a lot of stuff that was happening. Folks were in shock. It wasn't just, uh, you know, their health. It was like their business is closing and they're suddenly out of a job. The school suddenly closed, right? Like we went from uh, warnings and trying to understand what's happening to the whole city shutting down. Um, and understanding that well, we were are going through historic times. Um, and I think that that's just one of those things that kind of like folks that didn't have the capacity to think about. There were so many more urgent things than having to pay the rent. Um, but at the same time, it was a sacrifice that was made. Um, some landlords took advantage of it. There was some aggressive harassment that was happening around it. Um, and so it really became a rallying cry in the sense that uh, this wasn't anyone's specific fault. Nobody did this. Um, you know, folks would happily go back to work so they can pay their bills, right? Like really understanding what was happening and this being a, a perfect example why government needs to step in and provide for its people. And this is just something that needed to happen. And I think that, um, as each month went by, you saw those folks that at first resisted or were concerned to just really understanding um, the power that they were trying to wield. So it was, it, and it's still great to see, um, you know, people coming together in a movement like that. Um, yeah, I can add on a little bit to that. I mean, I think one of the things that has been really like Marcella was saying, it was just kind of like overwhelming in a way that people were not really expecting like the loss of income. Um, we have had like had really strong movements across the state um, and actually across the country to, to cancel rent and to sort of, um, you know, combat the idea that people should be in debt for something basic like housing. Um, and yet it has been I think it really shows like how disconnected um, most elected officials are from the like from the constituency that they represent, and actually why it's so important for us to elect more socialists to office. So early on in the pandemic, a number of states passed like temporary eviction moratoriums, um, including New York. Um, although even that didn't happen without significant pressure from from tenants. And then there was some research that came out last uh, November showing that when the statewide eviction bans were lifted, uh, cases of COVID-19 went up. Um, and so the, uh, there was an estimate, this was like a study from just, a few different universities um, estimating, oh, I'm sorry. Can you hear me? Can folks can hear me? Okay, good. Sorry. Um, so basically, um, the the study shows that um, that when the eviction moratoriums lapsed, it actually led to um, over four hundred thousand cases, um, like excess cases of COVID nineteen that might have been prevented if people were not getting evicted during those months. Um, and so this is just sort of like a pretty basic thing that if people have 
you know, and people were saying like, homeless people can't stay home. If you've been evicted, you don't have a place to live. Right. If you want people to stay at home, they have to have a home. They have to have a place to go to. And so it's like pretty unsurprising in many ways, um, but good to have this data that actually the eviction moratoriums have prevented, um, we're preventing cases of COVID-19 and New York's eviction moratorium is gonna expire in three weeks. Um, and so part of that, like that lends some urgency to the fact that we really need to continue organizing around preventing evictions, um, both by extending the moratorium, by passing good cause eviction, by creating additional tenant protections. Um, otherwise, we're going to see, you know, more surges of COVID-19. We're going to see other health problems. We're going to see um, all these really preventable health problems and ultimately deaths because people don't have like a basic right to housing. Can I uh, just say something really quickly? Absolutely. Um, cool. So yeah, uh, just to add on, and I think, um, and I'm sure everybody on this call knows this, but you know, the entire cancel rent movement wasn't about folks who were just lazy and didn't want to pay rent, right? It was out of necessity. Like in the Crown Heights Tenant Union, uh, basically mid-March, we started having people reach out to us. And, and mind you, these are a lot of our members of folks who were already struggling before the pandemic to pay rent. Um, and then they had a lot of them had lost their jobs or they had started uh, or their hours had started to get cut. So, you know, it was a cry of uh, for help for us. You know, um, it wasn't it wasn't that we were trying to get over, which I know is a narrative by some folks. It was legit. People legitimately realized that, you know, that, that they were going to that they had lost income and they we weren't going to be able to afford rent. And, you know, um, uh, Karen spoke about the moratorium. I think it's always important to uh, and this is why we need more socialists in the office. Um, it's, it's always important for us to remember that all of those moratoriums were because of tenants. It was because of our actions, um, whether it's at Livingston, Livingston Street here in Brooklyn or all over the city, um, we kept the pressure on our electeds. Um, and I think that's always important to remember as well. Um, they wouldn't have done, you know, they did the bare minimum for us, by the way, and they wouldn't even, they would not have even done that had it not been for us putting the pressure on them from the outside. So I think that's always important to remember. Absolutely. I think there's, I, I don't know it off the top of my head, but I think there's a statistic that, you know, every, the vast majority of New Yorkers are, are one or two paychecks away from not being able to pay their rent. So when we have a crisis like COVID-19 where so many people can't work or are losing so many hours, you know, it, we don't have a safety net. Um, okay. Well, the next thing that I wanted to jump to a little bit, another intersection of, of housing and healthcare, real estate and healthcare, are hospital closures. Um, in the past 20 years, over 18 hospitals in New York City have closed their doors. Two thirds of those closures have taken place in the city's outer boroughs. Um, and the majority of those were in low income communities of color which were almost one-to-one, -one, the same communities that were hit the hardest by COVID-19. Um, and just to throw in another note, um, you know, 40% of those hospitals, once they were closed, were turned into residential buildings, many of which were luxury apartments and condos that were way too expensive for the average New Yorker. So to me, this is another issue that sits kind of right at the center of housing and healthcare, where hospitals are falling victim, not only to the inequalities fun in, our, in the funding of our current healthcare system, but also to predatory real estate markets. Um, and I know right now, for example, we have the fight going on to save the King Brook Medical Center in Brooklyn. Um, and I'm just wondering if anyone on the panel wants to speak a little more either to that fight or just generally to um, the impact that these hospital closures are having on their surrounding communities. Um, I, can, uh, I, can, I can talk about a hospital that was so in my part of Brooklyn, there was a hospital called um, Brooklyn Jewish. Um, it used to be like a huge, it basically took up an entire city block. Um, and it was like a full service hospital. Uh, it closed in 1983, I think, 83, 84, somewhere around th that time. Uh, and then it sat dormant for, you know, for a good while. And eventually it became what you just uh, mentioned. It's now mostly market rate housing. 
um, uh, the little, the, the, the few um, rent stabilized units that, um, that, they, that the current city council member was able to secure will at some point sunset and those will become market rate as well. And anyway, so that's a, I live in a, a neighborhood with a perfect example where hospital was extracted from a, a, from a poor uh, and working class community. And now our community is, is lined with urgent care centers. Like um, that's what people use. And you know, in my opinion, urgency, an urgent care center is not the same as a hospital where you can go and like get preventative care and stuff. Most people go to urgent care centers like when they're sick right um because they want to avoid an emergency room which is usually overcrowded and anyway um I, i'll i'll try um i hope I, I do this artfully but i'll try to connect um that closure and the covid crisis so you know when covid hit we know that uh this time last year you know it devastated black and brown communities um and a community like mine um folks in my community were sitting ducks for covid right and what i mean by that is folks had tons of comorbidities um, because we because we live in areas where we don't have access to preventative care, right? Where we don't have access to healthy food. And so like in our housing, you know, our housing, uh, we live in conditions with, uh, um, you know, deteriorating buildings, you know, pest, rodent, like all of the, so basically we were like in the in the Petri dish, I guess, of like all of the bad things that just, that just made us more susceptible. I think that's a, I think like folks should, we should not be afraid to message that more often and clearly that like as many black and brown folks didn't have to die um, over the course of the last year, but we basically just, you know, we set the conditions for years to allow something like COVID to come in and ravage us. And, you know, the last thing I'll say, so I live in a rent stabilized building. Um, it is still majority um, uh, black and brown folks who live in this building. It's not uncommon in black and brown communities for there to be multi-generational living. And part of that is because, um, because of the uh, lack of affordable housing. So you'll have, you know, generations of families living under the same roof. And what I noticed um, in particular in my building was we had a lot of people who couldn't um, stay home. Uh, they had to go to work. So like empty employees, nurses, and et cetera. Um, and so a lot of those folks, when they got sick, they came back home and they couldn't socially distance. So COVID actually, it ran through my, there were tons of families in my building. We had four people in my building actually pass away um, uh, during the pandemic last year. And I, I, so I think it's important to, all, to also mention that, and that's the connection. And it was, and the last thing I'll say is, what was weird for me is, so that my building is a rent stabilized building. The ones around me are the same. And so they're, we're at, the buildings are mostly occupied by the same kinds of people I just mentioned. And while we were suffering and we couldn't social distance, there is a condominium that has been built like right in my backyard. It's a 12 story condominium that sat empty the entire pandemic. Um, you know, while people needed, you know, could have used the space to socially, to social distance. So I think that's important too, to just realize like, this is the reality for a lot of folks. Um, and yeah, I hope, hope I was artful in like drawing those connections, but yeah. Yeah, I I mean, Michael, that I think was very like a, a great description. And I actually, if it's okay, I wanted to show a map because I know everybody loves a map, but it kind of builds on um, what Michael was talking about. So I'm gonna see if I can share my screen here. Um, yep. Uh, seems like that works. So this is basically what I'm going to show is a map um, actually that was made by some of the folks that I work with in my day job. Um, can you guys see this? Yes. Um, should be a map with some dots on it. Um, and this is a map that's kind of illustrating uh, on a broad scale hospital closures in the last um, the last 30 years or so. So since the late 80s, at least 18 uh, community hospitals have closed in New York City. Those are the black dots on the map. Um, over two thirds of those hospitals are in the outer boroughs. So the, the green that you can see is like the darker green is where people have a higher median household income and the lighter it gets, the lower the median household income in that neighborhood. So you can see there are a couple households, um, or sorry, a couple hospital closures in 
parts of Manhattan that are wealthier, but there are also a lot that are in um, lower income parts of Staten Island, Brooklyn, Queens, and the Bronx. You can see this is like in um, Jackson Heights, which was really the, one of the early centers of the pandemic. There's a couple in some of the lowest income zip codes in the Bronx. Um, I'm going to actually just like change this here. So this is now showing um, hospitals that were closed in like uh, majority people of color neighborhoods. Um, some of these are the same um, in terms of like the neighborhoods that have the lowest um, median household income. Um, and then this is the percentage of the population um, surrounding those hospital closures where people had COVID-19. And this is a little out of date. It's from last April. So the numbers have changed a little bit. But um, you know, we all read last year about how many people were like in Elmhurst Hospital or in um, Kings County Hospital in Brooklyn, like these community hospitals that just got like overwhelmed by COVID patients. Um, and then, you know, what Michael was saying is true on a broad scale. Over 40% of these hospitals that closed were replaced by luxury residential developments. So instead of community institutions that are serving people and providing health care, um, they were replaced with developments that aren't affordable for people in the neighborhood to live in. Um, and so I think we've really, like, as a city sort of societally been like making these decisions about like what kind of resources we need in our community and what we don't need. And I think that really did set us up um, in a major way for, um, for some of the impacts of COVID-19 um, that didn't necessarily have to turn out the way they did. Absolutely. And our hope is that the New York Health Act would act as as one line of defense against hospital closures, um, because it would it would be paying hospitals the same for every kind of patient. So currently, you know, hospitals um, that are closing are relying on you know begging the state for additional funding uh, because they have too many patients on on Medicaid or Medicare who are or who are uninsured or underinsured, um, and thus they get underpaid compared to hospitals with a better you know payer mix, hospitals with patients with private insurance. Um, Whereas the New York Health Act would abolish that whole situation so that safety net hospitals will be paid more and luxury hospitals would be paid less. Um, and it's also worth noting that you know, hospitals spend about 10% of their budgets on just billing staff, which is something that could obviously be slashed if we move to a single payer system. Um, so hopefully there would be some seismic changes within that bill that would you know, prevent the idea of a struggling hospital from even you know, being a thing in the first place. But I'm curious what other sort of lines of defense at the state or city level we might have to, to protect our hospitals. I don't know if, if maybe there's anything around, you know, I'm just throwing it out, but maybe like if there are land use or like community, community land trusts or if there's anything maybe more from the the you know community land perspective that might that might also be something that can protect hospitals or prevent hospital closures i'm not sure um i've uh you know i've been thinking about um you know and this is uh it's not fully formed so don't judge me um, yet but you know i was thinking about you know when when we do um, when we allow a lot of the rezonings to happen um, across New York City, we often don't, especially in neighborhoods of color, we don't think about um, infrastructure and mandating certain things. So for instance, you know, if, if someone wants to build a 20 story um, luxury tower, um, we never can hear like um, how many, um, how many, more, how many more school seats uh, uh, are going to be needed to, to accommodate, you know, that new population? Uh, some and, and some rezonings uh, we do, but I don't know. I was thinking recently, like we should also do that for things like hospitals. Like we should have a certain amount of hospital beds, um, uh, um, you know, for for communities when we're thinking of things like rezonings. Um, yeah, I'm not sure. It's I mean, it's still not. You know, I'm not. It's just something I was sort of thinking about that you know we could we could start to think about like mandating um, 
things like that. Yeah, I just wanted to share that at the city level, um, there was supposed to be this comprehensive uh, look at rezoning the city as a whole. And I know one of the things uh, folks were pointing at uh, were the um, upcoming rezonings, uh, spot rezonings in different communities, particularly communities of color, uh, because we were during the, because it was during the pandemic to really put everything on hold. Um, but it'll be interesting to see what um, what stuff is included um, in the citywide effort. And I think that uh, for a lot of us, it's really going to be um, up to government and ensuring that we're putting, uh, you know, that this is a priority and we start we uh, we start truly building an infrastructure um, that's going to prepare our folks and really investing in our community so that we won't be susceptible to something like this happening again. Thank you. Um, okay, so um, I think I'll move on the sort of final topic that I wanted to, to cover before we get into the Q&A, which by the way, if you have any questions, any thoughts that have sparked in this conversation that you'd like to share, please feel free to put it in the chat. Um, but the last thing, and Michael touched on this, I think, I think really beautifully um, a little bit earlier, but it, it's housing is a social determinant of health. Um, and when we say social determinant of health, we mean something that's outside an individual person's genetic makeup or personal decision making um, that affects their health outcomes. And social determinants of health are responsible for a whopping 75%, um, it's estimated, of a person's health outcomes in their life. Um, so, you know, as much as I'd love to be able to say during our New York Health Act week of action that the New York Health Act is the answer to all of our community's health problems, the truth is that, you know, even if we have the best healthcare system in the world, kind of exactly what Michael was saying, if you live near a power plant that's polluting your area, or if you have lead in your water pipes, or if you have rodents infesting your building, people will still get sick. Um, so sort of upstream of treatment, we have preventative care, and then upstream of preventative care, we have things like housing that are playing a massive role in public health and in the health of our communities. Um, so this week and in the coming months, we're gonna be asking our community to rally around the New York Health Act, um, which is I think an enormous piece of our public health puzzle, um, but it's gotta be in tandem with so many other equally transformative measures across other areas of public policy. Um, so maybe starting with Karen, I'd love to invite each of our panelists to talk about another initiative or policy or organization that our attendees here could think about supporting in the interest of this sort of holistic whole community vision of public health. Great. Yeah, so I wanted to just talk about a few different things, some of which are actually like really live ongoing fights at the moment and some of which are like, like still building, um, but we really, I think the the like, like I said earlier, like the everything that Naomi said in her presentation about healthcare basically is like true for housing too, like, you know, Currently, we're relying on the market to provide these systems, and it, it just doesn't work. Um, and actually, in the same way that, that like commodified healthcare is more expensive, commodified housing is also more expensive for like foreign working people who spend more of their income on housing. Um, it's also really burdensome for the state to administer all these like programs, Section Eight and City FEPs and this and that. It's like it's very. Uh, like administratively burdensome and it's not actually more efficient for the government, but it is more profitable for landlords and the real estate industry. And ultimately that's why we do it because they have a lot of power. And so <clears throat> what we're trying to do sort of, I think throughout DSA, both in the housing working group and the healthcare working group in different spaces is really to like shift that power dynamic. So um, I was talking earlier about evictions and, and all the work that um, that has gone into like creating the eviction moratorium. It's going to expire on May 1st. I think it's probably going to be extended beyond May 1st. And maybe Marcella can talk more about the discussions that are happening in the legislature. But overall, the, the approach of the state has been to just like continue to kick the can down the road for another month or another two months or whatever. And we are really um, invested 
in the housing working group in pushing uh, good cause eviction as a statewide bill. Um, it's actually a bill that was introduced by another one of our socialists in office, um, Julia Salazar, in 2019. Um, and basically what it would do is say that landlords can't evict people for no reason. Um, so in a similar way that like just cause like um, job protections mean that like your employer can't fire you for no reason. So it mean that your landlord has to have a good reason to, to evict you um, and that they can't just like raise your rent beyond a reasonable level. And then if you can't pay that say, okay, I'm evicting you. So it both, um, it, it really like broadens the protections of rent control and rent stabilization beyond just like current rent stabilized apartments to places across New York City and places upstate where um, people don't have those protections right now. So good cause um, is, that's like a live bill that we really wanna um, have passed by the end of this session. We're having a field launch next Monday. We're really, really excited to work with Marcella and the rest of the socialists in office to, to make this a reality because we can't just keep fighting evictions every, you know, the moratorium ends and we try to do this and like plugging all these little holes. We just need to say, um, we're not doing it. We're not having evictions anymore. This is not the way, um, this is not the way that our housing system is going to work. Um, there's also some other bills um, that are active in the legislature. Um, one thing that I wanted to share, um, I think folks know a lot maybe about what's going on in New York City public housing and all the some of the like major health crises that are happening there um, to do with mold and other really bad um, living conditions. Um, this is actually a huge problem as well upstate, um, not just in public housing, but in private housing with like lead. Um, and I'm sharing this recent New York Focus article. New York State actually has like the highest rates of child lead poisoning of any state in the country. Um, and this is falling disproportionately on like kids of color in Syracuse, Buffalo, Albany, like upstate cities. Um, so there's also um, a big push to try to um, really create more, um, more testing, more regulation, um, prevent landlords from like harassing tenants when they complain about, um, about lead paint. Um, and then just to say on like a broader level, um, because of all the things that people have talked about around the commodification of, um, of healthcare and housing, we're really trying to shift the conversation to be about creating more social housing, both by allowing tenants the opportunity to purchase their housing if it goes up for sale and bring it into community ownership, whether through a co-op or a land trust or nonprofit ownership. Um, and also for the state to really invest a ton of money in um, creating new social housing. Um, so really expanding the idea of public and community ownership because ultimately, if we still are relying on private landlords to provide most of people's housing, it's always going to be this like uneven uh, sort of power balance where we're like fighting uphill and we really want to shift that so that we're not relying on private corporations and private landlords to provide places for people to live. Thank you so much. Um, let's see, maybe Marcella, is there anything you wanted to talk about in the interest of public health and other things that people should be supporting or thinking about? Um, yeah, no, Karen explained it really, really beautifully. Um, uh, there isn't any talk about extending the moratorium, but I think it's something that um, is needed. Uh, there's this attitude in Albany where uh, there's no urgency to anything. Right, and so to them, they're giving, everyone's patting themselves on the back, you know, there's a bunch of money for rent arrears, which is great, um, but certainly not doing enough. There's some vouchers for folks and the homeless to try and get them out of the shelters. But, you know, again, it's not enough. So I think that um, one thing that I'm hoping that we can do, and we'll really need a lot of, a lot of support um, is, you know, what you mentioned, which was a good cause bill, and this will bring basic tenant protections to, so a bunch of tenants that don't currently have it. And so wanting to look at ways um, where we can pass legislation that can kind of be additional help that people need to try and write this out as we then start looking at long-term um, commitments and changes. And if we're gonna get anywhere near 
really having a conversation about social housing so that then we can start investing in it. Um, you know, this is part of the work that we have to put into it, right? Really building a larger base to be able to take something, uh, tackle something like that on. There's some legislation being proposed. There's some funding coming for NYCHA as well. Um, there's, uh, you know, some bills that are being tossed around, particularly uh, one where um, tenants would get like a, a rental abatement for, uh, you know, waiting um, what would seem like uh, extra time to get, you know, basic repairs done, right, where they're living in, in bad conditions and try to use that as um, a way of applying pressure to the city as well. So uh, definitely um, some good ideas. Again, uh, temporary solutions to try and get folks through uh, this current situation and then really needing to, to think about things long term. Um, I would say everything that Marcella and Karen said, and um, the only, I guess a couple of things I would just add on, uh, particularly like in the housing spaces, as good as the, uh, the rent laws were in 2019, there are still ways that um, landlords can find to, um, uh, uh, um, to continue to screw us over, to be, uh, uh, to put it quite frankly. So we need to, you know, re-engage the, uh, the fight to basically eliminate things, uh, MCIs, um, get rid of things like um, substantial rehabilitation, which is a way that they can um, deregulate their buildings, um, demolishing them as well. We have a case here in Crown Heights where it looks like that's what a landlord is trying to do right now. So there are still some things we can do um, to strengthen our tenant protections. And I think the last thing I guess I would say is um, we shouldn't give up the fight um, uh, to raise revenue on New York's uh, most wealthy folks. I know it was, it was disappointing for a lot of us, but, you know, we should just, we should, you know, we should just um, continue to re-engage with that fight, you know, strengthen our efforts on the outside. And, you know, also this may be controversial, but, you know, there were a lot of, um, you know, unions who, who signed on in support of those six bills. And these are a lot of the same, you know, DSA held people to account. So like we're of a separate, um, you know, I, I put us in a separate category, but you know, there are a lot of nonprofits and unions that signed on um, to invest in our New York. Um, and they didn't put enough pressure on a lot of these electeds. There are some of the same folks who endorse and support, you know, folks like Stuart Cousins and um, Carl Hasty. Like, you know, we, I, I think, I think it's time for other groups to start to, um, to carry their weight in these fights as well. And um, I think, I think we shouldn't be afraid to message that, that, you know, you shouldn't, you know, signing on is, is one thing, but, you know, you got to do more than that. You know, if you really care about um, increasing revenue so you know so on the rich so the rest of us in this state can live you know we have to start holding these electeds to account so I hope we I hope that campaign comes back uh, uh, next year is what I'm trying to say um, and I hope we're we're stronger um, organizing on the outside I would also throw out there uh, Michael's being modest but there's also a city council campaign you can support if you care about these issues um, <laughs> Mike for Brooklyn um, all right, with our last, uh, you know, four minutes or so here, um, I think we might have time for one or two questions. If anyone has a question they'd like to drop in the chat for our panel, or I don't know if, Amr, if you caught anything higher up. As of right now, uh, we don't have anything in the queue, so please feel free to fire away. <laughs> you guys were, were too comprehensive. We were too clear. Um, That's what happens when we're all on the same <laughs> panels, like every day. We're just like, yeah. Um, I'm actually a little bit curious to know, and maybe you guys all know this, and this is really boring, but I'm curious to know, like, what the New York Health Act fight looks like over the next few months, and what are some of the key things that you guys are focusing on, and ways that both, like. Um, you know, the housing working group can support ways that like 
um, you know, the council campaign and like state legislature can support. So I'm, I'm kind of curious to know what that fight looks like. Sorry, I know I'm on the panel, so I'm not supposed to ask the question. <laughs> <laughs> no, that was perfect. Thank you, Kate. I wonder maybe if one of my, my uh, uh, healthcare members up in the, the meeting might be able to field that one for us. We can hear someone besides me for a little bit at the end of this meeting. So uh, Keith, I think, uh, volunteering or, or Alice. Go for it, Keith. Uh, hi. Yeah. So um, essentially, we're hoping to uh, get it passed by the end of the legislation session, which is, I think, the 17th of June. It's mid late June is when it ends. Um, and uh, so first, it'll have to be introduced into uh, three committees, and it'll pass through them, and then the leadership has to put on the floor vote. So we're kind of planning to work our way up to and both, both in the assembly and the state side. So we're basically planning on getting uh, the co-sponsors in both of those chambers to be vocal and enthusiastic about it, while also seeing if who else we could flip because we have recently flipped more and more people than we were expecting. Uh, trying to get kind of a rank and file legislator enthusiasm and support to have them pressure in addition to, of course, telling random people on the street to call <laughs> Stuart, Hays Stuart Cousins and Hasty um, to try to get there to be kind of a feeling of a block of sort of rank and file legislators. Uh, then once it's in, you know, committee, um, the second phase of the campaign begins and, and we pressure the leadership a little higher. Uh, that's around when we're expecting the uh, writers of the bill, the original sponsors, uh, Rivera and uh, Gottfried, uh, to sort of swoop in and um, also, you know, add all of their energy to it. Uh, and then we get the floor vote. We technically have the votes on paper, um, but it needs to, we, we need to demonstrate to the leadership that there's enthusiasm kind of among the right and file. So that's sort of the overall strategy to getting this done in the next couple of months. Thank you, Keith. All right, and um, we are at time. Thank you, Alice, for dropping in the chat. Um, so this was our second or third event in a, in a larger week of action. So if you go to our website, healthcare.socialist.nyc, you can see all of the events that we have coming up and um, get involved in the fight to come. So thank you all so much for joining us. Uh, this was a really productive conversation and I really appreciate y'all jumping in. Thank you, especially to our panel, Marcella, Michael, Karen, um, you guys are amazing. Thank you so much. Thanks so much guys, it was a pleasure to be here.